Um, I have 23 slides to get through in what was supposed to be 25 minutes, so I'm going to try to keep this relatively tight. If Mike, if you can proceed to the first slide. The first slide. So this is the landscape of what's happened as far as the COVID-19 uh, infections on a worldwide basis. You can see it's extremely broad based, over 200 countries and over 2,500,000 uh, cases. Actually, that's dated, that's only Two to two to two or three days old. If you look at it right now, there are two million six hundred twenty-six thousand and change uh, confirmed cases uh, across the world, and once again, over about two hundred countries. So to say this is a fluid situation is a gross understatement. This changes not just daily but hourly. You can see also from the size of the circles that the United States is now basically the global epicenter of where the cases reside. <clears throat> Next slide, Mike. Next slide, Mike. Mike, do you want to shut off the audio on your computer? Don't don't disconnect anything. Just shut the sound, the speaker off. Uh, I've tried to do that, but I'm afraid that I'll shut everything down if I do that. If you can just lower the volume on your computer and not mess with Zoom, that would solve the reverberation. Uh, that's going to be hard to do as well, Michael. Okay. I don't have I don't have any icons up right now, so I can't see where the icons are. If you hit the uh, escape button, yep. it should minimize your screen. Yep. There and you then go. shut off your speaker on the sound. All right, remote audio, audio is off. Okay, so I, I move forward the slide. Just let me know when you want me to progress. That sounds good. Okay, let's continue. Move this out of the way. All right, so second chart. Um, once again, this is the, the so-called curve that you're looking at. Confirmed cases through the 21st of 2,518, recoveries of 659,000, and deaths of 171,000. Once again, update for that today. Confirmed cases, 2,626,000 and change. Recoveries, 710 and change. Uh, that's in thousands, obviously, and deaths, unfortunately, at 183, 283. So once again, a still a fairly significant increase on a on a numerical basis from one day to the next. Next chart, please. If you look and see where the cases are, you've really got two things. You've got the U.S. as we mentioned earlier really with the first graph, and then the rest of the world. So no question, the U.S. being, once again, the epicenter of where these cases are residing at this juncture. Other curves from other countries are definitely at lower levels. Granted, they're lower populations as well, but the, uh, the slopes of the curve are not quite as dramatic um, at this juncture as the United States is. Next graph. Um, Mike, also, if, if you don't mind taking your full 30 minutes, um, I'll I'll actually yield some of my time back to uh, the rest of the speakers, and we'll just be 15 minutes uh, late. So sure, yeah, we'll go through. I'll plow through these, and so you want me to proceed to the next slide?
Okay. So uh, can we go back up? Uh, the, go back up one slide, please, Mike. All right, good. Now forward again to the slide you were just on. So here's the um, the tests that have been administered um, across you know a, a variety of countries, and you can see, um, granted, the United States has the greatest amount of cases. It also has the greatest amount of tests that have been performed, and this has been a big topic, talking point of President Trump, who was lauding the efforts as far as the United States, as far as you know, by far having the greatest amount of tests that have been administered. And while that is true. If you look at the tests per million people, um, the United States is basically only in the middle of the pack right now on the tests per million paper, uh, people. So it's, while we've done a great job as far as the total number, uh, relative to the population, it's a, a relatively mediocre display. Um, and right now we're testing at about 150,000 people a day most of the health authorities believe that we need to be testing at 500,000 a day or more in order to really get a hand in a, on what's going on as far as the uptake of the virus. Next graph, Mike. Here's where some good news comes in. Um, confirmed cases. If you look at uh, on a global basis, obviously the cumulative change is just remarkable, you know, over 2,700%. But if you look at it on a day by day percent change, this is where once again, we're bending the curve. You'll hear that a lot from the, once again, the health authorities, such that the overall caseload now is only, only increasing at about 3% per day. Next slide, please. And as far as deaths, which have about a two week lag to cases, same story. Um, only increasing once again at about a 3% rate or so right now on a day-by-day -day basis, once again, with about a two-week lag over the new cases that uh, are identified. Next slide, please. As far as the economic impact, it's been, you know, basically, uh, I guess you could say, uh, remarkable uh, in many ways. If you look at the left-hand side of this, I have the Conference Board Leading Economic Index Indicator, and this is the greatest month-over-month -month drop in the record of the conference board, uh, creating the series of the United States leading economic, basically series, going back to, it actually was back to 1958. So down almost 7% with a one month print on a month on a month basis, a significant drop in economic activity. That's also reflected in the, the chart on the right hand side, which comes from ECRI or the Economic Cycle Research Institute a think tank out of New York and Washington that, uh, that creates econometric models of the U.S. economy. And this is their comparison of their weekly leading index versus GDP. And obviously the takeaway here is that the recession of 2008-2009 looks like at this juncture will fall in comparison to what we've seen as far as the downdraft in this weekly leading index coming from um, ECRI. Next slide, please. Here are samples of individual forecasts coming from a variety of economic consulting firms, investment banks, research um, uh, entities. And you'll see the title says, you know, the forecasts are V, U, or fishhook, fishhook being a relatively, you know, U-shaped bottom, but not a full recovery. And if you look at some of the uh, purveyors of this, you'll see some examples of each one of these different type of shapes of, of the recovery. So, for example, if you go to Q2 2020 and take a look at, uh, let's take a look at, um, probably the best one to look at would be uh, Barclays. Where is Barclays there? Oh, it's, this is an older graph. Sorry, let's, let's do this one. Let's start at, uh, we'll start with, uh, with Evercore. So, Evercore, you can see down 50% in Q2 GDP, the upper right-hand side. And Evercore continuing on Q3 still sees GDP down about 5% in Q3. And then only a minor recovery for Evercore um, in Q4 up about 5%. So that would be the example of a, a fish hook recovery. If you can compare and contrast that with someone like Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs in Q1 
down, uh, you know, approximately, you know, take it 9% or so. Q2 down 32%. Q3, though, for Goldman Sachs, up almost 20%. And then Q4, once again, still a strong recovery from Goldman Sachs up in excess of 10%. That'd be more of a V-shaped recovery coming from Goldman Sachs. So basically across the board, there's no real discernible pattern as to what these firms feel is going to happen to the economy on, a, on a, uh, you know, an ongoing basis. Next chart, please. From a global standpoint, if you look at what the IMF is saying, uh, on the left-hand side, you know, they follow 189 different countries on a worldwide basis. Um, and as of their last report, which was put out last week, in excess of 90% of those countries were in some form of contraction, economic contraction, as compared to expansion. So once again, if you compare and contrast that to 2008, a significant more detrimental uh, picture being formed once again, based upon the IMF ex expectations of uh, expansion versus contraction. And if you look at their GDP forecast, roughly down 3% as far as global GDP for 2020. And then they do have a V rebound going back up in excess of 5% for 2021. Um, I'm a little suspect of both those numbers. I think it might be a little light on the downside for 2020 and a little too aggressive on 2021. I'll explain a little bit more about that um, in a moment. But next slide, please. From this, we've seen, as has been well publicized in the financial press, some unprecedented response from the Federal Reserve and basically central banks and, uh, and governments uh, around the world. So starting with, the, with the, the Federal Reserve, you can see once again, uh, dropping interest rates to zero in one fell swoop, basically, uh, what happened. So we've got 0% interest rates in the short end of the curve right now, actually still in the United States, based upon some T-bill rates, we actually have some slightly negative rates as well, like some of the other countries on a global basis. And as far as the change, the weekly change in the, in the Federal Reserve assets, um, we're talking half a trillion dollars for example, basically, you know, a few weeks in a row. So the Fed has increased the balance sheet by over $2 trillion in the span of about three and, three and a half weeks, which is completely unprecedented, even if you take into consideration the Great Recession of 2008. So the Fed really has stepped up to the plate to try to minimize the effect um, on the U.S. economy based upon what's happened with COVID-19. Uh, Next slide, please. Once again, on a global basis, similar response. If you look at the upper left-hand graph, you can see on a global basis, the countries around the globe that have cut rates in 2020 and below that, the actual cuts from a, a, a handful of, of countries that are just cited here, as far as the actual cuts that were made by the central banks during 2020, largely in response, once again, to the, to the virus. And then an estimation of the actual stimulus coming from Cornerstone Macro, Nancy Lazar and her crew. And if you look at it, the key takeaway is the bottom right-hand side of this. If the combination of the central bank liquidity injection and fiscal stimulus coming from the various governments, she estimates that the actual stimulus to global GDP is 17.3% of global GDP. Once again, an unprecedented response to this crisis that we're coming, uh, uh, that's come to fruition for us right now. So once again, not just the U.S., but many other countries, economies, Federal Reserve Banks, central banks, and governments have, uh, have tried to do their best to ward off um, the effects of the virus. Next slide, please. Initially, pretty significant shock to uh, financial conditions in the United States is the St. Louis Fed Financial Stress Index. It looks at three different areas to you know, come up with these, uh, this number, this line. It's interest rates, credit spreads, and then other market indicators like the VIX and or the S&P 500 uh, return itself. And a significant spike that we saw similar to what we had in 2008. You can see it came back down though as of April 10th, and this is run about a weekly basis in a week in arrear. So I won't see this new number for April 17th until probably Monday. Um, my guess is it's staying about this level, but we had a dramatic spike in financial stress in the system 
that once again, these actions of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and Congress have helped to, uh, to alleviate. Next graph, please. Volatility, significant spike. And I think for people who have heard me before, this is one of my favorite graphs that I like to you know, keep updated. It goes back historically to show spikes in volatility across four different asset classes. U.S. stocks in blue, emerging market stocks in green, treasuries in red, and currencies in, in that gold color. And uh, with the Canora, Canora, uh, coronavirus, we saw obviously a spike, particularly in, in the VIX, up over 80. We're at about 40 right now, but it was the largest print on the VIX index that has ever been recorded. So a significant spike in volatility across multiple asset classes at the same time. Subsequent to that, obviously, you can see it has fallen down. As I mentioned, the VIX is back down at you know 40, which is still an extraordinary level, but obviously nowhere near that 80 spike that we saw uh, earlier on in the, uh, in the virus. Next graph, please. This is um, pretty interesting as well. We went from, you know, on February 19th, uh, having the second longest, second strongest bull market in the S&P 500 on record to within 16 days going into a bear market, the fastest that we've ever entered into a bear market coming out of a peak in equity prices. So only 16 days to go down more than 20% in the, uh, in the S&P 500. Next chart, please. Related to that, we've seen a relatively significant hit to earnings estimates. So this is through April 17th coming from FactSet. Let's give me some historical standard here. Back in December, um, the consensus estimates for earnings growth for the S&P for 2020 was that earnings would be up 9.2%, and you can see the progression and then we fell off a cliff, obviously, between February 28th, when it was still supposed to be up 7%, to March 31st, where it fell 3.3. And where we stood as of April 17th was down 12.3% as far as consensus, consensus expectations for earnings growth, I should say earnings losses, uh, for 2020. And on the right-hand side, the collapse in the PE multiple, the S&P 500, which it started off, you know, about at 22 times trailing earnings and fell down to about 15 times trailing earnings or about a 15% drop in the PE multiple. And you can barely see this, but it's come back up to about 18 times right uh, again right now, as we've seen the rally in stocks, once again, make PE multiples a little bit more dear. Those numbers are important going forward. So remember the 12.3 and the minus 15. Next slide, please. Here's the actual um, sector by sector effect expected for 2020 as far as earnings. And to no one's surprise, obviously, energy has got the biggest dividend, down 99% expect expectations for earnings growth in 2020. Um, you know, obviously, it's been well publicized. We're in the midst of a, 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 an energy war, per se. We have a tremendous, a tremendous amount of oversupply relative to what has been a significant drop in demand based upon the fact that what has happened with the virus on a worldwide basis. So we were once again in this complete supply demand imbalance uh, right now, which is hopefully going to be rectified as far as a, re a decrease in production, but the decrease in production has got a double-edged sword in that. Obviously, that, that decreases economic activity. So you're caught in this little bit of a vicious cycle at this juncture right now. Overall, once again, you can see that 12.3% drop of the S&P. And there's a handful of uh, Dr. Sangani that, here that are expected to uh, to continue to have growth in 2020, but not many. Next slide, please. And then, remarkably, for 2021, once again, the V-shaped recovery, not just in stock prices, but expected in earnings. You can see in the middle of the graph, the S&P is supposed to have a 21.1% increase in 2021 based upon consensus expectations. And that's being led by energy. I actually had to cut off the graph because that's not a misprint. Uh, energy is expected to have a, over 6,000% increase in earnings in 2021. Um, I'll take the under on that uh, based upon the fact that I don't see that dramatic a rebound in, in energy prices and generally, particularly oil, such that you're going to get that kind of recovery in earnings for energy in 2021. Uh, the other ones could potentially come through. Hopefully, if we do have more of a V-shaped recovery as far as the economy, 
that will pretend a V-shaped recovery in earnings and obviously support the V-shaped recovery that we're currently underway with as far as stock prices themselves. Next chart, please. Here's what normally happens, I guess you can say on average, to earnings and PE multiples during recessions. And obviously we're gonna be in a relatively significant recession. The NBER is what determines the recessions for the United States. That's a National Bureau of Economic Research think tank out of Cambridge, Massachusetts that does it generally in arrear. So it'll be interesting to see when they say that the recession started, whether it be February or March, but no question that we're gonna be in the middle of a relatively significant recession. Historically, if you look at what happens to earnings during recessions on the left-hand side is that they usually drop in a median standpoint by 13%. As I mentioned earlier with the graph, we were at a 12.6% ex expectations of drop in earnings, uh, once again, consensus for 2020 currently. So we're basically kind of right on top of what has happened on a median basis. But if you look at 2008, which was a really, you know, obviously it was called the Great Recession, earnings actually fell 45%. So it wouldn't surprise me at all that earnings for 2020 will be a number that is greater than or less than, I guess you could say, that minus 12.3% that has been publicized up to, to, to now. Likewise for the PE multiple, as I mentioned, we had a 15% contraction in the PE multiple at its worst moment. The average PE contraction, obviously, throughout these, um, these recessions going back and earnings has been, you know, basically 23 to 26%. So the 15% drop doesn't look all that severe uh, relative to history. It could be, once again, a, a retest of some of those lower PE multiples and those, those lower prices. Next chart, please. I went back and I took a look to see on the price action that we've seen since February 19th of the S&P from that peak. To compare it versus, I looked versus the depression, I looked against 9-11, I looked against the, uh, the Black Monday in 1987, a variety of different uh, you know, drawdowns in the market to see uh, what had happened to prices. And what I came up with is that the closest corollary or the closest rhyme that we've had as far as price action has actually been back in uh, 2008 with the Lehman bankruptcy. And almost from a tick by tick standpoint, we were matching that same kind of downdraft that we saw during the time immediately following the Lehman bankruptcy. We've had a pretty significant relief rally um, since the bottom. The bottom, I believe, was on March 23rd. And so if you look at that red line, we've actually retraced about 50% of the downdraft. It's not going to show that mathematically, but that's actually about the, the, the retracement that we've had. And on the right-hand side, once again, it gives you, we were actually 27% off the bottom. That's the far bottom row of information right here to say max gains during bear markets. Um, we've rebounded about 27% or so, maybe a little bit more given the price action today, over 28 days. So that's uh, interesting. It's, it's been a, a, a pretty remarkable um, you know, rebound rally here over a relatively short period of time. Uh, but if you go to the next graph, I'll kind of compare and contrast what might happen going forward. So once again, this is the S&P 500 going back to actually the 1930s to see what's happened to prices after you've had a 50% 50 50 retracement of a decline that was at least 25%, which is what we just went through from an all-time high. So we just went through this, obviously. And um, the max decline, as I showed, was you know down 34%. Uh, we have come back 27%. That's the second column of data. But then if you look at the historical performance of the S&P, when it's been in that condition in the past, uh, returns are generally mediocre at best out to uh, six months. You do get a rebound after one year, but that, once again, it usually correlates to the length of bull markets and the length of recessions that they generally last someplace around a year, and then they you know, turn around and start doing better. So next graph, please. Here's actually a snapshot of bear markets and recovery since World War II. Um, I've described the type of bear market, which usually coincides with the economic backdrop as well. And as of right now, we're obviously considering this, co uh, you know, the coronavirus being an event-driven event that started in February. 
And if you look historically between cyclical, start structural, or event-driven um, uh, bear markets and quantum recessionary periods, obviously the last structural one we had was the Great Recession of 2008 um, on the collapse of the banking system. You'll see that an event-driven bear market usually lasts the shortest amount of time, but usually still eight months in length. So we've been in, you know, a, a bear market now, you know, since since February, only a couple of months in. It would be remarkable for us to come out of it that quickly from a, a a timing standpoint. And the decline has been obviously down 27 percent, um, not great, um, but we've had more severe ones in the past as well. And then the time and event driven ones uh, to get back to previous levels, it's usually about 13 months before you attain the same price level that you had before you went into the bear market. If you look at this, we've had one kind of V-shaped recovery back in 1990, which they claim was cyclical. I claim it was probably a, you know, fairly much, fairly much event driven as well. That was a, an oil price shock, which spiked inflation and caused the Fed to stop on the brakes as far as interest rates are concerned. So, it only lasted a uh, three months. We were down only 20%. So we barely covered the threshold at that point in time as far as a bear market. And it only took us four months to get back to the price levels that we had before the bear market actually started. So it's not unprecedented, but it's unusual to have that kind of a V-shaped recovery in that short period of time. I would expect that we don't get a V-shaped recovery per se. Um, I think this rally that we've seen is kind of you know, um, plain vanilla in nature, quite frankly. And once again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked to see a retest of the lows, though I don't think we'll break that 2200, which seemed to be the bottom of this, uh, of this trough that we had recently. Next graph, please. And then the number of months of recession, this is once again, similar to bear markets. If you look historically, how many months the, uh, the economy has remained in recession, on average, going back once again to 1980, about 13 months you stay in recession, the median being 11. If you back out, you know, the 1929, the Great Depression, that 43 months, you back that out. I did that number. You don't see it here. But it just drops the average down from 13 down to 11. So once again, you should expect that the recessionary type of environment is going to be around not just for the two months that we've seen, that this is going to last for many more months into the future, uh, hopefully nothing more than 11. Next graph, please. And here's, uh, you know, before my final recap, here's a, a, a flow chart, if you want to call it, of the stages of investor psychology. And I was trying to pinpoint where I thought we have been in the last month or so. And I would say we definitely went, you know, down the scale from, fear to desperation to panic and probably some capitulation selling as well. I don't really think we got to the despondency category. Despondency is when prices languish at low levels for an extended period of time and that no matter what comes out of you know, news across the media, you just can't seem to get prices going. So I don't think we hit that level yet where there's complete despondency where people say, I'm never investing in stocks again. Um, it, so I don't think we have to go to that level. I think that the Fed, the Treasury, and the government may preclude us from getting to that. We may stay in that, once again, no go lower than that panic capitulation. But, um, but once again, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, we've gone a little bit too far, too fast on the recovery in stock prices relative to what we're going to be seeing from economic releases and that we will have some kind of retest of the lows, though I hope that that 2200 does hold for the S&P 500. Final slide, Michael. And here are my conclusions. Good news is that the, you know, the so-called curve is ascending at a decelerating rate, or as the media has been talking about, and the health authorities bending the curve, which we are in the midst of doing. There is truly a large dispersion of economic forecasts, and I could say there's probably a large dispersion of forecasts for earnings per share for the S&P 500 as well. Monetary and fiscal responses should temper the recession. I showed you that unprecedented amounts of action from the Fed, from uh, the Treasury, and from Congress. 
The stock market has already priced in a garden variety recession, so I don't know if we get worse than this that it can go lower, but it's already priced in what I'll call it a garden variety recession. And my estimation is that V recovery in the economy is highly unlikely. I think this is going to be something which sticks around for a while as far as the um, drag effect on the economy. I can't see people rushing back into football games or soccer games or concerts anytime soon in masses. And as far as the stock market, it's been, once again, you know, a very strong uh, bounce off the bottom. But I'm highly suspect that that can be maintained in the face of what I think will be, once again, pretty significantly uh, worse statistics as far as the, uh, the economy is concerned going forward. Um, I've obviously run over my time. Michael mentioned that. Um, I usually take questions, but I would say this time you can forward your questions to Michael. I will answer questions if you provide an email. And if you want to copy the slides, once again, contact Michael, uh, and he will provide that for you as well. Uh, I hope this has been informative. I want everyone to uh, to stay safe, you know, for the next, hopefully not months, but at least uh, days and weeks. And um, I hope things go better for everybody. Thank you. So, Mike, um, thank you very much for being a member of FLYA. Thank you for getting Boston Partners involved in our group. The presentation was fantastic today. We have a bunch of questions that did come in. I will put those uh, together in uh, our follow-up, and I will send them to you so that you can uh, address the questions. And, again, I want to thank you for having Boston Partners as a member of, of FLYA. It's, it's, it was a great presentation today, and we, we also hope that, that you stay safe. Thank you, Michael. Be well. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. So with, with that said, I'm, I'm sorry that we um, are running a, a little bit late here. Um, you know, we have the next panel that was supposed to start at uh, 1.30. We had a couple of technical glitches, uh, which we quickly resolved. Um, so how we're going to adjust to this is we're not going to cut the next panel short. Um, I'm actually speaking after, um, after this next panel. And um, I'm going to yield 15 minutes of my time uh, to uh, deal with the topic that everybody is very interested in and waiting for, uh, which is uh, real estate. And uh, with regards to real estate, uh, there's a, a variety of views, the short term views, there's medium term views, there's long term views. Um, but we want to discuss this today uh, with you all. Um, this was the highest rated um, part of the day, and uh, the reason that it was highest rated is a lot of you took the time to rank the topics inside of our surveys, and uh, the results for this panel were off the charts. Um, so just really quick, we'll be doing a, a follow-up. Um, we're getting a lot of requests for the previous presentation. Um, we will be doing a, 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 a follow-up, which will include a, a recording of each of the presentations today. We'll also have uh, a way for you to book a meeting with uh, each, of the, each of the companies and, and the presenters. It'll be included in the, uh, the follow-up work that, that we do.